Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to this event, and it's delightful to see community people. We hope that our outreach to the community, our ads in the spec and uh, in various other places, uh, reach you and obviously re reached you, so thank you very much for coming. This is the second in a series of public talks hosted uh, by the McMaster Health Forum as part of the Labarge Optimal Aging Initiative at McMaster University. The initiative was made possible by a generous donation from McMaster Chancellor Suzanne Labarge. We're delighted that Chancellor Labarge is in the audience this evening and wish to express our sincere appreciation for her vision, generosity, and her ongoing support and advice. My name is Susan Denberg, and I'm the Associate Vice President in the Faculty of Health Sciences. It's been an honor and a privilege for me to oversee the ambitious agenda related to Suzanne Labarge's generous gift. I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Mike Evans, Associate Professor at the University of Toronto, Director of Health, Science, of Health Design Lab, and scientist at St. Mike's Hospital. I'd also like to welcome Robert Ridge, President and CEO of MedicAlert, who will say a few words at the end. Special thanks go to the organizers of tonight's event, who were critical in planning the series of talks as part of the Labarge Knowledge Translation Enterprise. Guided by John Lavis, Ilana Churia, and the other members of the organizing committee, the team at McMaster Health Forum continues to outdo itself. McMaster aspires to be the gateway to optimal aging. We have a number of complementary and collaborative initiatives, including the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, that are guiding McMaster towards a leadership position among Canadian institutions in the realm of aging research and knowledge translation. Our established expertise is growing and becoming more widely established and recognized, aided by the recent launch of the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal, and I think you saw a cartoon on that at the outset. Tonight provides a unique opportunity to participate in a dialogue about how technology changes the way patients use health information, an issue of great relevance to all of us. I trust that the comments you hear and make yourselves tonight will be the starting point for many other discussions at the university and in the community. I'll now turn proceedings over to John Lavis, professor in the Department of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics and director of the McMaster Health Forum. He'll introduce the speaker. Thanks very much, Susan. Welcome to those of you who are here, and welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Nowadays, uh, you can't always tell the turnout because so many folks choose to come in remotely. Uh, I'm going to introduce Mike with the important stuff, the official stuff, and the fun stuff. The important stuff, he's a Hamilton boy and a Mac rat, so that's <laughs> what really matters. Uh, the official stuff, you heard a little bit from Susan, Associate Professor of Family Medicine. He holds an endowed chair in patient engagement at the University of Toronto. He's a staff physician at St. Michael's College, where he practices with an inner city practice. He's a scientist at the Lee Cushing Knowledge Institute. But the fun stuff, this is not someone who you want to play that game where they tell you two th correct things about themselves and one lie, because I wouldn't believe a lot of this stuff. But uh, the first one, maybe, winner of the 2014 McNeil Award from the Royal Society of Canada for Public Education about Science, started a medical school for the public, wrote a best-selling medicine textbook and a best-selling children's book. I think the children's book was probably harder, but both of them would be daunting. He hosts the CBC radio show, and, and, and he was not fired from it on Friday. That was, that was another host. He was a doctor at the Sochi Olympics and a water boy from Wendell Clark. I'm curious about that last one. Uh, he runs a media lab and a film company, and he has over 10 million views on YouTube. So it's my great pleasure to welcome tonight Mike Evans. Mike. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, a real pleasure to be here. As uh, John said, I am a Hamilton boy, a Mac grad. Uh, I just ran into George Sweeney, who is my uh, tutor in uh, year one. I was an English lit major from uh, McGill, and uh, not any sciences, George, I'm sure can attest. And uh, I do remember, though, the highlight of my first year was uh, we, we had a kind of show and tell, 
and um, the other guys brought in their master's and PhD thesis. And uh, the only thing I had, I was centerfold for Powder Magazine that year. And so uh, George swept all the PhD theses out of the way and went right through my uh, ski magazine article. So that was uh, a highlight. So uh, thank you for coming, George. Um, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of things uh, uh, so that it kind of reflect my interest. So I'm a family doctor. Uh, I have a practice, St. Mike's. It's... Um, you know, like there's a security guard in the weight room, so it's a, a sort of a heavy duty inner city practice, very complex uh, problems. Um, I spend more and more of my time uh, in a media lab, so I run a media lab with filmmakers and designers and creatives, and I'm going to show you some of that, some of our product. And then my sort of one uh, bigger interest is things that are good for a lot of things. So. Uh, I'm talking about eating, exercise, and then usually I'm talking about uh, kind of health innovation, uh, YouTube, uh, kind of innovating from the periphery, uh, but I just, uh, I got the sense there's a lot of community people here, so I am going to talk a little bit about, I snuck in some sort of healthy life uh, slides, if that's okay, uh, that kind of reflect my interests. So, um, so I'm going to start with the kind of big picture, get into uh, uh, you, a little bit about peer-to-peer -peer healthcare. Uh, we have a project going now called the Better Life Experiment, and, uh, and then thinking about you as a disruptor if you're in the health field. Um, and I'll explain all these terms as we, uh, as we get going. So, um, so the basic uh, tenet, this is a classic kind of Larry Green slide. Um, I work in a big academic hospital. Uh, St. Mike's, so one in a thousand problems comes in there. I'm a family doctor. Uh, one third of healthcare problems comes into, you know, family doctor, pharmacist, physio, nurse practitioner, sort of primary care. But two thirds of problems are actually, healthcare problems are actually solved at home. Uh, self care, self management. And it's funny, when we think about innovating the healthcare system, we think of a fancy machine in a hospital. But I actually think the biggest opportunity is actually creating better decision-making, better self-care, self-management uh, at people's homes. So, um, and so there's so many ways that that can evolve. So I'll just pick out two or three here. So I run something called an email clinic now. Um, so I'm not paid for it. Uh, so this is the principal barrier and the other barrier is privacy. Uh, but, um, and I started when an 87 year old said to me, Mike, my husband's got Alzheimer's. I just can't come in. Can you email me? And you, you can't tell an 87-year-old woman, uh, no, I, I can't email you, what are you talking about? So, uh, so we started it up and uh, uh, it's kind of a long story, but what's, what's interesting about it is, you know, if, so if I have somebody with a chronic disease, you know, I used to see them six or seven times last year. This year I see them three times, but I'm emailing them nine, nine times. And our relationship is actually better. Technology doesn't work if it doesn't make our relationship better. And so it's actually made our relationship better. So I would do a lot of work with Kaiser Permanente in California. All their clinicians are on salary. Uh, five years ago, they were all typical, see the patient in the clinic. Now 40% of, and, and if, if, if John was my doctor, I would, uh, it would say, do you want to see John uh, in the clinic? Do you want to phone him or do you want to email him? And now 40% of their interactions are done outside of the clinic and they're able to kind of broadcast and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's very interesting. Now this person in the center is an amalgamation of all the people around the outside. And so far patient engagement has been very much focused on that person, a kind of one size fits all. But this person and this person and this person and this person, all very different ways of understanding, of, of knowing, uh, different levers for change, different numeracy, literacy levels. So we're looking at much more of a, of a buffet. This is sort of the most interesting group. Uh, so StatsCan data in 2007, maybe 21% were online of the over 65 crowd. Now there isn't so much Canadian data, but the Pew just uh, released something in uh, April 2014 showing 59%, whereas the rest of the crowd's at 84%. But the fastest growing group overall uh, our seniors and those that are our users are heavy users so 71% are using it every day and of course there's a lot of proxy use so you looking up stuff for your uh, uh, people in your family and so on and so forth so if you're building an intervention now for seniors you're probably wanting a web uh, version uh, you'd have to do a lot of usability testing and so on and so forth but you're not ignoring that now this is sort of more of a banal but kind of classic issue. So this is a, a patient whose um, uh, niece 
uh, was in at the hospital. Uh, she has Hodgkin's and uh, uh, she uh, had been bit by a, uh, a bee a couple of days ago and then had developed, you can see here, uh, uh, this uh, kind of red rash. And this is a classic uh, thing called cellulitis where it's, it's not actually a reaction to the bee bite, it's just that the, the bite itself introduces bacteria into the skin there. And uh, so she wouldn't be able to get to her family doc for two days, she just sends me a picture uh, and I'm able to phone in a prescription for easy peasy. And, and we do this all the time. We just get them to right there. And then the next day, if it's beyond that uh, fringe, this one's an obvious case. Uh, but just such, such a classic thing, like why is that person needing to, to come in and see me? I'm not gonna do anything different in the clinic. So just thinking about innovation for a second, those of you in the business of, of trying to innovate, uh, probably the biggest bump we've had is expanding out our team. So. Uh, you know, before five years ago, I would just build stuff with the, the clinicians and the nurse and the, uh, the people in my clinic. And then I expanded out to creative. So filmmakers uh, like Nick DePonte and Wendy Rowland, uh, illustrators like Lisa Sorza and Disa Kauk, um, and uh, editors and podcasters. And we built this uh, creative team and that's made our project way better. And lots of failure, by the way. So our most successful whiteboard, which has about four, four and a half million views, the first thing I did is I built uh, hockey cards to explain medications. And I thought they were gonna be a total home run hit. And we hired Lisa to draw them, our illustrator. And they were a total failure. The seniors that we tested them on said they were too jokey joke. So then we did a, a kind of low literacy comic book for women with breast cancer, uh, pre-diabetes. And that was what I would call a base hit. Uh, and then I said, oh, Nick, can you just film me while, I, while Lisa's writing and I'll tell a story? And, and, and he goes, yeah, that sounds good. What, what topic should I do? And, and if, if I come from medicine, I would have done it on you know, diabetes or high cholesterol or one of our silos. But he goes, no, why don't you do it on what's actually the, the single best thing I can do for my health? Do, do you know what I mean? That's coming from the, from the person's perspective. Like, I don't care about all the silos. Just tell me the number one thing. And so my answer was activity. Not everybody would agree with that, but um, uh, so I kind of walked through the evidence. And, and so you can see that kind of fail, you know, strikeout, base hit, home run. I work in this clinic that's sort of got complicated patients and we'll come up with intervention. And I've got this guy who's actually a young guy in our clinic and he, uh, he'll always say, well, that's never gonna work with my shut-in or, or with my teenagers or whatever. And I go, yeah, maybe, but let's just roll it out. And we call that MVP, so minimum viable product. So if you are trying to improve your clinic, just to think about a little thing that you can just roll in there, it doesn't have to be perfect, but your, your mindset is, again, uh, sort of uh, improving all the time. So on that note, one of the things, one of the tricks that we use, I, I'm on a project with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in, in Boston and Cambridge, and we have something called a 90-day program. And uh, so we take a wicked healthcare problem. So it could be falls in seniors, a very tough problem. And we, uh, we, we um, you know, do a bit of a Medline search, but mostly we engage kind of ground fromages in the area. And uh, we kind of build our intervention. Uh, we drop it into clinic. Uh, we measure it with some metrics. And then we show an outcome all in 90 days. So very hard to do that. Anybody who's tried to do that. So our failure rate is about 60%. But you can be sure at the end of the 60 days, we know exactly what we screwed up. So the metric was too crazy. It wasn't nurse friendly. It wasn't patient friendly. It was too complex. It was too simple. Do you see what I'm saying? So when you push a uh, kind of quicker date on it, you get, uh, you get sort of quicker, better results. Um, so our motto in our lab is we suck less incorporated. So uh, we just put out something that sucks a little less than what's out there and let it rip. So. And this is, uh, I do quite a bit of work uh, with Maureen Bisignano, and this is her quote uh, uh, from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. A lot of times, and this is true in clinic, is we ask, you know, what's the matter? But we don't ask what matters. So I saw a patient last week, uh, uh, we were doing a colonoscopy on her, and uh, she just couldn't tolerate it, but we saw colon cancer, we stained it, and uh, she, um, has colon cancer and she's 83 and doesn't want the uh, 
operation, which I think is fine, and that's what matters to her, and her family was supportive of that. And then I sat down with the, um, the colonic surgeon, and they say, you know what, Mike, I've seen this movie before. Uh, it's going to be much worse for her if we don't do something about it. I can, um, you know, what we call laparoscopically do surgery, so go in it through a keyhole and, uh, and do this now. And I'm like, oh, okay. So then I meet with her, and she still doesn't want to do it. And I'm like, okay, am I explaining this well enough or not? Do, do you see what I'm saying? And so it's this constant battle going back and forth about what's the matter and what matters. And you'll see that with complex problems. So more and more, the silos of healthcare are demanding that we have, you know, all our over 80, 80 patients on cholesterol drugs or blood sugar drugs. When you look at the evidence, it's actually not very powerful at all. And what matters to the patient is more important. And so it's, it's, it's gonna be an interesting area as we go forward. And, and you know, we're very focused on obesity, which is great. There's lots of trials to show if we lose weight, we do well. But if I was a minister of health, I would definitely push a uh, walking program compared to a obesity program. Uh, and here's why. Because uh, if we look at um, uh, normal people who are unfit, their death rate's quite a bit higher than the obese person who's active. So I have lots of semi-obese people in my practice that are active, that are walking, and I'll take them any day of the week compared to the skinny sedentary. You see what I'm saying? So I'm not saying you don't want to lose weight. I'm just saying if you're active, you're, you're cooking with gas. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about peer-to-peer -peer healthcare. So peer-to-peer -peer healthcare is us. It's the, it's the public. And I actually think it's the biggest missing kind of health workforce out there. And uh, so I'm going to show you some of our uh, adventures there. So we have a, a media lab. So it's uh, clinicians and creatives and, and, and just people. Uh, and we kind of mix them together. Uh, to, and we sort of add in some critical thinking, design thinking, and positive change. So we, it's what we call storify evidence. So we take evidence and uh, uh, we kind of embed them in the relationships of care. So, um, uh, and, and what's so interesting now is, you know, when I started this, I just hand out my new thing in, in, in the clinic and we'd have, I'd hand out 25. And then I started something called the mini med school, so a med school for the public. And I'd have like 400 people there. And I'd be like, you know, I've gone from 25 to 400. Now, if I can make it engaging enough so that people put it on, we've had over a million people put our stuff on their Facebook channels and say, hey, check it out. And uh, so now we're over 10 million views. Do you see what I'm saying? So the whole world's changed that way. It's so interesting, the reach you can have. And if you can make that evidence-based, you know, and, and also show the limits of evidence and bring in some of the art uh, of care, and, and I think some of our value systems it's so interesting. And I, I think, you know, old patient education was sort of this, you know, it was like, uh, you know, so just telling people the obvious, like, you know, don't smoke, don't eat Scottish fast food, whatever. Uh, and or en français, ne prenez pas de area de ou la la. So now, as I said, you know, stories trump data. So I spent like tons of my time. My dad's here and I'd be like, dad, the PSA test, if we take one and and his eyes are glazing over. If I tell him a story, uh, that's so much more powerful. Uh, and, uh, um, and I think it's embedding those stories in the relationships of care. So we think that's, you know, McMaster to a patient. But that's actually a small piece of it. It's actually the friend to a friend, a loved one to a loved one, a daughter to a mother. And if you can make it engaging enough, uh, it will go. And I, and I think in some ways individuals trump organizations. Somebody uh, to kind of look at there. We were profiled in Oranges and New Black. Have you guys, do you know what Oranges and New Black is? Yeah, all the people here know what it is. Uh, so I had a bit of a hard time explaining the, the kind of plot line to the nuns at St. Mike's. But... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a lot of kind of, um, uh, it's just a great story around women and, uh, um, and, you know, how people end up in prison and some of this is very much uh, what a lot of people here at Mac do, looking at uh, uh, the social triggers of all these things and, and some of it's not so, uh, um, you know, it's very complicated and, and uh, but it's also looking at a lot of uh, uh, female relationships and so on and so forth. And then, uh, this, is, this is very interesting. So. Um, we allowed, when we did, when we did 23 and a half hours, uh, and we do it on other ones now, we allow people to kind of pretend they're me and translate into different languages. So it's been done everything from Gaelic to Hebrew 
to uh, Spanish or French. And we had this public health doctor in Riyadh uh, translate into Arabic. And we just threw it online. And we had 800,000 views in a week. So it was the fifth most watched thing in all of YouTube. And it costs a lot to make the videos, but the, the sound translation is like 50 bucks or something. So 50 bucks to hit 800,000 people in a week. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Now, Ultimate Pizza Sandwich still in first place. Uh, so uh, we've got some work to do. So, and then Nudge is our best thing so far. Do you guys know much about Nudge? So Nudge, I mean, there's a whole bunch of Nobel Prize winners in the last couple of years on it, but Nudge isn't sort of a penalty for not wearing a seatbelt. It's, it's something you're barely aware of. So every uh, grocery store is fully nudged out. So it's set up so you are buying things and they want you to buy those things and there's a whole science to that. So you're going, you know, I was with the head of Walmart the other day and we go to the back and he goes, oh, we have the pharmacy at the back because then they have to walk through the store and they hopefully buy stuff. We don't make much money off the pharmacy, but we make a crap load of money off all this stuff around the, uh, around the uh, pharmacy. Um, you know, if you put burgers, uh, if you put salad in front of burgers in a buffet line, the salad rate goes up 25%. So it's these small little uh, nudges. So this is the classic uh, nudge uh, that you may have heard of. So this is the, the urinal, the men's urinal in Schiphol in, in Amsterdam. And I'm there quite a bit. And, uh, uh, and so at that urinal, as with many men's urinals in the world, they have a problem with spillage. And so some genius went in and engraved a little black fly into the deepest recess of the uh, of the urinal, and so all the men, regardless of their culture, language, age, come up and they just, you know, try and kill the fly. And so uh, they reduce their spillage rate by 80%, because they're, uh, and they don't even know they're doing it, right? They're just like, I'm a male, I'm killing the fly. And so, uh, uh, so, so that's a sort of perfect nudge, and so we're looking for a whole bunch of nudges uh, in the work setting to kind of get people to be more active and it's it's very interesting. So um, So I've I usually sort of talk there's a sort of end part of my thing and I've, I've just sort of done two things here So I've I'm talking just a little bit uh, for the health innovators to think You know not everybody has a media lab and I so I'm going to talk about curation and a bit about kind of social network And then I'm just going to use as a little bit of a segue to talk about the importance of social networks for us as individuals so um, so, you know, I think we used to uh, 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 just, you know, it's just people would create and it would be the big businesses that create. Now you're seeing so much curation. So people who are really interested in sewing or in Montessori schools or in, uh, uh, you know, outdoor gear, and they're like just totally into it. So they're pulling the best stuff from around the world and sort of putting it in one place because their audience is connected to them around that. So you're seeing that. So this is a series that I did around depression and you know, the, it's first uh, uh, is, uh, when people explain things in a British accent to me, I, it, I tend to listen more. So this is uh, a CBT um, uh, example. But New Harbinger book is, uh, is a bookstore with uh, very, they actually have a whole evidence-based section in their bookstore and uh, I can send people there, you know, often for more of the minutiae of mental health. Uh, so if I send that to patients, uh, it's so much more uh, productive because I've already kind of curated that. Like I, I did a thing with, um, oh, what's her name? The uh, Indigo, Heather Reisman. Uh, and so I, I just brought in experts to look at the books. And uh, so the good example is what to expect when expecting. You know, do you know that book, the pregnancy book? So we had the experts look at them and see if they're evidence-based. That was the worst book by far in the whole uh, store. And it was uh, the one, it was the most bought book by far. And so we just had people read the books, the experts, and say, you know what, these are the most evidence-based. And some of the most evidence-based ones aren't the best, well, or most well-written or easiest or most engaging. So. It's a, it's, so th there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I think we have to kind of understand those, those nudges. Thanks so much for having me, and I'll, I'll I guess, take some questions. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to open it up for questions. One thing that we're trying to do with the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal is 
is find the stuff that's already infectious and rate it according to whether it's based on evidence. So when you said make it infectious, uh, I struggle with how do you make the good stuff infectious? So we can take that one step with the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal. But what else can we do? So we've got, if you contrast you and Dr. Oz, compelling <laughs> entertainers, both physicians, you're selling stuff based on good evidence. He's pushing products. Um, so how do you make, do you have any other ideas for us beyond what we're doing? How do we make the good stuff infectious? Yeah, so we haven't done a good job of making our, I mean, we've obviously put out all our references and done all that and, and been very evidence-based on our product, but we haven't made that uh, such a transparent thing in the sense, and I think that's partly because it's built on, on one doctor's brand. I actually think that, um, you know, you have a brand, you know, McMaster has a brand of literally the world leader and sort of evidence-based stuff. And I think uh, if you got into the game of saying, kind of like we did at Indigo, there's all this stuff on the shelf. Uh, uh, we're going to give the stamp of approval uh, to, to the ones that we think are the highest, uh, whatever. I would say, though, that you do have to make it, uh, you, you do have to kind of have one of your brackets is not just the most evidence-based, yeah, you know, yeah. it's like a Cochrane review. Yeah. It's incredibly evidence-based, but a lot of the time it's useless. Yeah, sure. so, so how do you kind of do that? And I think there's a commentary piece to that. And then another thing that we've done is the interactivity. So we put out one on HPV vaccine, which is a vaccine uh, for cervical cancer. And um, uh, a, a woman, a PhD actually from New York, uh, commented on our Facebook thing and said, uh, she was sort of passive aggressive, love your stuff, Dr. Evans, but how could you recommend a vaccine that it says right on the package, uh, it kills one in a thousand women? And uh, so I was able to say, well, actually in the first trials that were done in, uh, they were mostly done in the Southern US and then Australia, uh, about 25 or 26 of the women done in the 23,000 died. Uh, but they followed up with each one of them, and, and it was the southern U.S., so like six died of gunshot wounds, uh, and, and nine died in car accidents, and a couple had uh, lymphoma or whatever. So do you see what I mean? So they actually backtracked them all, and they do have to sort of put that these people died, but they didn't, they didn't find a causal link. Uh, so sometimes you can actually do that in the conversations, I think. But I think there's probably an opportunity around, uh, you know, stamp of approval. But you have to do a lot of marketing on we're the, uh, we're the gatekeeper. Yeah. Okay. So one Twitter question, how can patients engage clinicians in an engaging way? Innovative way, sorry. Yeah. And don't for, for anyone in the room, there's a mic now. You're welcome to come up and ask a question. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, all of our clinics, our patients are engaging us in innovative way. I, just a funny one, I had uh, in this email clinic, I had a woman email me JPEGs of her worsening hemorrhoids uh, the other day. It was pretty funny. <laughs> and uh, they had like, there was like 40 shots. It was incredible. And I'm like, won't be testing you for flexibility this year. <laughs> and uh, uh, so she got my attention in an innovative way. Um, uh, so I think... Um, uh, I think more and more what you're going to see is people, you know, either data visualizing their stuff back to their... So, so I'll give you an example. I've been doing a lot of stuff with Apple lately. I've been out there about five times. So their future, they don't want to get into the medical game. So they don't want to be adjusting insulin dose, but they're, you know, they have the phone and they're coming out with a watch in 2015. And so that watch, say, will have a blood pressure. It won't actually have a glucometer on it, but it'll have a blood pressure thing on it. And so... Um, so what will happen in the future is I'm seeing uh, my dad, uh, you know, two or three times a year for his high blood pressure. He's been waiting for half an hour in the waiting room. He's kind of pissed. He's a busy, important guy. And, um, uh, and his blood pressure's up a little bit. This will take it home. We'll data visualize it back to him. If he wants to be social, which he probably wouldn't be, but my stepmother would be, would maybe want to show a couple of people, maybe friends of hers with high blood pressure, she could kind of check it out with them. It'll drop in one of our whiteboards, which we don't have on high blood pressure, but it'll tell you, hey, when you have high blood pressure, your heart's working against a higher pressure system. It becomes an Arnold Schwarzenegger. We want an Abibi Bikila, like we want a long distance runner. And so, it'll, so they'll go, oh, okay. Half of people on antihypertensive drugs stop after a year because it's a silent illness. It'll actually track all your medications. Siri will come on and say, 
um, uh, hey, uh, John, you know, in a Jewish mother's voice or a Scottish mother's voice, you aren't moving enough. And uh, so do you see what I'm saying? It'll have all these little nudges in it. So I think what you'll see in the future is the, the question is, and, and you can see how that's going to crash, right? And then it's, it'll take a few levels to get better again. But, uh, but you could see uh, that one of the question, interesting things is what I'll bring into my clinician and what they'll be able to see of my record and how that will be extracted out. So I think that will be interesting. I think the ethnography of, you know, we send these patients home all the time and think they're doing X, Y, Z, and none of that's going on. So, uh, so watching my older patients go home and they say they're doing this and they're doing that, and that can get a little sinister, you know. So, you know, I was using the credit card example. You know, hospitals are looking at, uh, like, the guy who does the data mining says now I buy my junk food with my cash because I, I don't want the hospital seeing uh, uh, what I'm buying. So that's going to be the future is they'll be actually looking at that. So I think that'll be interesting. And I think people taking videotapes of themselves, you know, all that kind of stuff will be engaging. Okay. And fair warning for those of you who are in the room. I'm hoping to get a lift back to Toronto with Mike so you can't come up and use up 40 minutes of his time with questions later. You have to ask them now while we're in the question period. So the next Twitter question is, uh, you've been talking a lot about where you are and you're at the leading edge of patient engagement. What's exciting in the future for patient engagement? Where do you see the next wave coming? Yeah, so, uh, so I think the quantified self piece will be interesting that I just talked about because uh, I do think for those chronic diseases that's going to be critical. I do think you're going to see, and this is a partly answer to your next question, is you're going to see a lot more patients uh, uh, taking the system and making it much better. Because uh, right now their user experience is very poor. So, you know, I talked about email clinic. Like, why a patient's coming in, sitting there for an hour, like often four hours in hospital, um, uh, they have no idea what their data means. So, and we're the problem. Doctors are the problem. So at Sunnybrook, they have my chart where patients can see it all. All the patient, or sorry, all the doctors resisted it completely because I'm worried about when I write, you know, my dad a X-ray thing and I write SOB on it, and I mean short of breath, and he thinks it means something else. Uh, but 99% of the time, uh, him seeing his stuff is great, and we have to get much more. So he's actually seen his cholesterol things and is telling it back to him. Uh, so I think you'll see that quantified self and how it kind of integrates with uh, what what we're doing. I think you'll see periodic health exams uh, um, that will totally flip and, and, and we'll see that kind of big data being collected and you'll see a small dashboard there about where you're at uh, that will customize to your own preventive stuff. Um, I think we'll see um, a lot more uh, governments sort of pushing nudge stuff so uh, around uh, kind of healthy behaviors. Um, the biggest problems now are uh, and this might be an upswell as well, like I'm starting to get into food much more and you know the biggest issue there is big food, you know the marketing budget for Captain Crunch is, Crunch is bigger than the CDC, so especially when we're looking at pediatric nutrition, so uh, so that's going to be an interesting thing as we, you know like Whole Foods when you look at their new campaign it's all about uh, you know trying to get you more invested in your health kind of thing, so this will be interesting uh, future, and I think patients will be leading some of that as well. Okay. Next Twitter question, email with patients. How do you protect patient confidentiality? Yeah, so my hospital got mad at me when we started our email clinic. So this is one thing is because hospitals have lawyers, and they're like, no, what if the person prints off their thing? And I'm sort of like, there actually has never been a patient with a, uh, email thing that's actually had any legal case so far in all of North America, and I'm sure that's going to change. Uh, so we just went and used a portal called WellX, completely outside of the hospital. And I just said to my patients, I'm going to do it. I don't get paid for it, um, which is the biggest barrier. And so WellX is locked down. And, um, you know, I ran a session for clinicians the other day, and a guy uh, at the, or a woman at the front said, you know, I don't want to get emailed at 4.30 that my patient's suicidal. And everybody in the room's like, no, I don't want that. And then a guy behind him said, well, I'm an adolescent psychiatrist. I've had to totally switch into messaging my patients. It's the only way it works for me. And so, and I've, I'm much more likely to get that email than you. I've had one and I'm so happy that it, you know, I got it and I was able to react to it. 
Another one with the back said, I do insulin starts. My patients are traveling four hours. Why I'm not emailing them, which I'm starting to do. So I think uh, we'll be picking off those parts and it'll be locked down just like your banking and everything else. And uh, we just have to get over that. Uh, and will somebody be able to breach that? Yes. And so, uh, but the uptick in, 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 in the user experience would be vastly uh, uh, much higher. So I think it'd be interesting. We've struggled with a whole bunch of, like we started it in, I'm gonna run the email clinic from 12 to five, and then we had it, oh, I'm gonna get back to you in 72 hours. So we got most of them back pretty quickly, but allow this to sort of go over a weekend and make it seem like it's not an emergency service. So there's all these little tweaks to it that we've been sort of doing. And I'm not an expert, there's lots of people more expert than I am. So. Super, excellent. So I think we're gonna wrap up a final few words from Robert Ridge. Robert is the President and CEO of Medical Alert Foundation of Canada. They reach the lives of I think 600,000 plus on heroines, more than 1.2 million Canadians, one of our new partners at the forum. Uh, Robert, over to you for some final comments and then I'll do the final things. Well, I must admit I'm uh, thrilled to be here tonight to uh, take part in this, uh, this, this uh, talk because I'm a real fan of Dr. Mike. It was a thrill to meet him in person. Uh, we have over 1.2 million Canadians across Canada who are Medical Alert members, and we encourage them to play a more active role in their own health care. And uh, Dr. Mike's work really provides the inspiration to do that. Uh, they're simple messages, but they really resonate with people. Um, they're entertaining, but at the same time, I've heard from so many people that they've not only watched his work, but they've actually, they've actually changed their behavior because of it. And I can think of no greater compliment than that. Uh, so, so thank you, Dr. Mike. Um, it, we're we're obviously thrilled to be part as well of the, the uh, of our relationship with the McMaster Health Forum, and um, uh, I, it was it's great that, to see everyone come out tonight. So, thank you.